All right, good evening and welcome everyone to Mount Washington Observatory's Science in the Mountains series. My name is Brian Fitzgerald and I'm the Director of Education here at Mount Washington Observatory. Thanks so much for joining us and to share about how plants are responding to a warming climate across the higher elevations of the Northeast is Appalachian Mountain Club's postdoc research fellow, Jordan Toraville, who will join us in just a little bit here. Thanks so much for joining tonight's program. For those of you who aren't already familiar, the Observatory is a nonprofit member-supported organization with a mission to advance the understanding of the forces that create Earth's weather and climate. And the way that we accomplish that is through our weather operations and operating our summit weather station and regional mesonet with around-the-clock weather observations and forecasts by conducting research and product tests on the summit of Mount Washington and elsewhere, and by conducting and developing innovative educational programs. If you have questions for tonight's speaker and you're joining us through Zoom, please make sure you use the Q&A button. You can find that at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you're on Facebook and joining us that way, thanks so much for being with us. We won't be able to get to your questions there during the program, but we'll uh, try our best to follow up after the program and get you some responses there as well. If you'd like to connect for a future program through Zoom, make sure you register for a program over at mountwashington.org slash SITM. Alrighty, so before we kick things up for tonight, I will uh, be launching a quick poll here for those of you who are joining on Zoom. So you should see some questions pop up in front of you just in a second here, we have four questions for you this evening. The first one being, we're always curious, where are you joining from this evening? Perhaps you're joining from within a state here in New England, perhaps outside of New England, or even outside of the US of A. Uh, second question, we're curious. It's coming up really soon, just next month. Have you or are you perhaps planning on participating in the Observatory Seek the Peak event this year? Curious to see how many of you have joined us in the past. Perhaps, yes, you have joined or you will be joining. No, maybe you haven't, or maybe this will be your first year. Always curious. And then we have a couple of trivia questions from our speaker, Jordan, this evening. The first one being, how much warming has occurred on the summit of Mount Washington over the last roughly 80 years? All in Fahrenheit there, zero, one and a half, three, or five degrees Fahrenheit. Apologies there, we had an errant question in there. We can ignore question number four. And then number five, on average, how far are alpine tree lines advancing upslope in the presidential range of the White Mountains every decade? Is it no change at all? One meter, three meters, 10 meters? Get your responses in there. And we see quite a few of you responding already in just a, a few more moments here. We'll close out the poll and we can share some results with everyone this evening. So just give you about five more seconds here and we'll uh, get going here uh, in just a second to share uh, even more. So we'll end it in three, two, one. All righty, we will uh, end it there and share some results. Thanks everyone responding. New Hampshire, the big winner this evening, over a third of you joining from the Granite State, but good representation all throughout the rest of New England and quite a few of you from outside New England. And hey, three of you joining from outside the country as well. Welcome to everybody. Thanks for joining. For those of you curious about Seek the Peak event this year, you got some time to register if you haven't already over at seekthepeak.org. Seek the Peak's the largest uh, fundraiser of the year for the observatory. Uh, generally speaking, it's a hike-a-thon in which folks hike. It could be Mount Washington or another mountain or climb of your choosing all in support of fundraising for the observatory uh, throughout the year. It's coming up here Saturday, July 15th. And well, most of you have not done it yet. So I highly encourage you to check it out over at seekthepeak.org. And perhaps this can be your first year. Join us for the after party at the base of the Mount Washington Auto Road as well. And for the two of you who said that this is your first year, welcome. Excited to have you join. And perhaps we'll see you up top on the summit for a tour of the weather station as well. All right, on to the trivia questions. Uh, a pretty good split there between one and a half and three degrees of warming Fahrenheit over the last 80 years or so for the summit of Mount Washington. We shall see. And then last but not least, a good split between how much that tree line has uh, shifted upward um, one meter or three meters, though quite a few of you also thinking perhaps as, mu as much as 10 meters uh, every decade 
uh, on the presidential range in the White Mountains here. So we will find out. In fact, I do know the answers. Our speaker certainly knows the answers, but it's up to you to pay attention to uh, uh, the presentation this evening to see if you can spot those answers. So without further ado, hey, Jordan, I'd love to welcome you to tonight's uh, program. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. <clears throat> well, feel free, take it away. We'd love to hear all about your work and uh, the work of your colleagues uh, over at the Appalachian Mountain Club and elsewhere. All right. All right. Hear me, see me? Looks great. Sounds great. Take it away. All right. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Brian. And thank you to the uh, Mount Washington Observatory for giving me this opportunity to speak with you all today. Um, as Brian mentioned, uh, my name is Dr. Jordan Torville. I'm a postdoc with the Appalachian Mountain Club. Uh, and for those of you who are not familiar, the AMC is a very longstanding nonprofit organization really dedicated to uh, the recreation and the conservation of high elevation areas really across the, uh, the Appalachian uh, Mountains here in uh, eastern United States. Although we do do a lot of work uh, specifically in the Northeast. Uh, and I'm going to very specifically talk to you today about how plants have been responding through time uh, to changes in climate in these very sensitive areas. Uh, so just to get a, a flavor of what's going on, uh, the AMC, sort of, and a lot of people don't really realize this, is we have quite a large and robust research department with a lot of gr really great scientists and staff that work with me uh, to address some really critical questions uh, facing uh, the continued health of these high elevation areas. Uh, so with that being said, we have quite a lot of research infrastructure really across uh, the White Mountains specifically, but our purview does extend across really the whole Appalachian Trail Corridor. Uh, so that includes monitoring stations that measure uh, uh, air and soil temperature, uh, we monitor stream chemistry, a lot of other useful climate indicators. And I will be talking a lot about uh, various aspects of this, uh, this infrastructure. <clears throat> but just to get some context as to where we are in the Northeast, um, uh, my colleague, Georgia Murray, uh, recently conducted some research looking into long-term climate trends, uh, specifically on Mount Washington, also at lower elevation at Pinkham Notch, which is at the base of Mount Washington. And what she found was that over the period of time in which the Mount Washington Observatory has been recording uh, temperatures, uh, we've found significant warming throughout this period. In fact, on the summit of Mount Washington, this comes to about 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit of warming through this period. Um, this is comparable to regional trends, although it's important to note that the summit and other high elevation areas are not warming quite as fast as other lower elevation areas. Although we now know that across all seasons, there is significant warming occurring. So that's the context we find ourselves in here. And when we look at specific seasons, for instance, winter, this translates to a loss of maximum snowpack depth, a loss of total snowfall, and earlier snowpack melt, which leads to a longer growing season time. All of these have mass, potentially massive uh, implications for plant species. Plants in general um, are very responsive to changes in climate. In fact, plant distribution to a large extent is determined by climate conditions on the ground. And so for us to be able to detect uh, the severity of climate change and how it's accelerating through time, useful indicators would include uh, plant-based indicators. And so tonight I'm gonna to talk about a little bit about the research that we've done looking at to, looking into a couple of very useful uh, bioindicators of climate change. And the first I'll be discussing is how tree lines have been shifting in these high elevation areas through time. And then I'll also talk about how uh, plants in alpine and lower elevation woodland areas have shifted in their phenology. Uh, I'll explain this in a bit, phenology related to the timing of certain life history events for plants, such as flowering or leaf out. And although we're largely interested in our highest elevation areas or our alpine areas across the Northeast, this really could extend into the rest of the Appalachian Mountain or the Appalachian Trail Corridor. So it's, it's relevant beyond our, our, our region. <clears throat> and so to get right into it, um, the first, project that I worked on um, 
with the AMC was this uh, the shifting tree lines project or mapping tree lines uh, and how they've been changing through time. And just to get to some basic definitions, what are tree lines? Um, in our case, when we when I mentioned tree lines, I'm referring to the upper elevation limit to which trees can maintain a tall, upright growth form. Usually, this is very climate controlled. Uh, cold temperature will initiate growth limitation at these very high peaks. Um, assuming anyone here who has hiked, especially in the White Mountains, you, you know what I'm talking about. Trees will start to become shorter and shorter until they're really flat to the ground. And then at a certain point, we don't find trees anymore. So beyond that, we encounter the alpine zone. The location of that tree line, we think, is very tightly controlled by uh, things like climate, but other factors as well. <clears throat> And here in this picture of Franconia Notch, I put arrows to the rough places where tree line appears to be. It's not an exact science, but we get pretty close. <laughs> the important thing to note about these is that not all tree lines are created equal. There are very distinct differences in how they look, the forms of these tree lines. A lot of effort has gone into categorizing different tree line forms based on the density of the trees we encounter tree line and how they decrease in height across this ecotone between woodland and alpine systems. Uh, really good research has uh, come up with these four kind of very broad categories of tree lines. Uh, as you can see here depicted on the left and some images depicting each one uh, across the globe on the right. And these are diffuse, abrupt, island and crumbled uh, tree lines forms. Now, what's important here is that what causes the formation of each of these different forms, the primary mechanism is slightly different between them. So with this abrupt crumpled and island form, we think of, we tend to think of things like strong winds or icing that causes physical damage to adult trees or kills small seedlings that are trying to establish upslope. Um, these are things that are you know, indirectly climate related, wind and icing. When we think of this diffuse form on the top here, this is thought to be generally more controlled by growth limitation, which is more directly related to temperature. And so by using this, the thought is, if we could identify these particular tree line forms, could we have a much more useful and very targeted indicator of climate severity, given that there's a more direct relationship between tree line location of this form and other tree lines. So that's the general idea going into this project. Um, our primary goal was to really understand if tree lines were shifting upslope consistent with warming trends. And some assumptions that we had going into this was one, that tree lines were in general sensitive to changes in climate. And that changes in climate conditions on the ground could be further modulated by complex topography. So things like uh, the slope of a surface or the aspect, which direction it faces. All these are very important in changing, potentially changing temperature and could impact uh, the location in which we find tree lines. And so a number of hypotheses went into this. One, because we were interested in seeing if tree lines in the region had indeed been shifting up slope uh, throughout the last several decades, we thought if our region is indicative of the globe as a whole and other studies have indeed found that tree lines have been shifting up slope, um, in other places in the world with warming. We thought that was also the case here. So we wanted to see if that was true. Secondly, we wanted to see if these diffuse tree lines I discussed, these tree line forms that we think may be more sensitive to temperature directly, if these are, could these be more sensitive to the increase in temperatures that we're seeing, which means that these could be more related to greater elevational shifts of these tree lines. So these potentially could be very useful bioindicators essentially, the severity of climate change. We wanted to know if that was the case. And lastly, we wanted to see if variation in tree line advance could be explained by both climate and topography. So we wanted to see if there was an inter any sort of interaction between uh, changing temperatures, things like aspect and slope across these very complex uh, topographical features in these mounds that we, we find ourselves in. <clears throat> And so to do this, there would, we took a remote sensing approach. And what that is, is just basically uh, taking data that we don't, we can't directly take from the field, but we take from other sources. Uh, for instance, aerial photography or satellite imagery. In our case, uh, I initially took these uh, 
near cut, these false color near infrared images um, from the National Agriculture Imagery Program from 2018 to serve as a sort of modern point of comparison for where tree lines are now. And I compare them to historic uh, aerial uh, images that I was able to secure from the AMC's basement uh, at Pink of Notch, and I was able to scan and digitize these. And from these, I was able to use a spatial software known as ArcGIS, known to many of you here, probably, and stitch all these scenes together to make these composite images of both the presidential range in New Hampshire and Katahdin in Maine. From that, I was able to manually delineate or figure out where Treeline was from these old images. I was able to place random points on these tree lines that I classified and then compare it to the nearest location from the classified new imagery. The difference in the elevation between this old and new point on average represents the change in tree line position through the, that period of time. Uh, imagery was taken in 1978 for the presidentials and 1991 for Katahdin. And just as an aside, we would like to in the future include some old photos from the 40s to serve as an even older point of comparison, but we haven't done that yet. Uh, we assigned those one of the four tree line forms I described earlier to each of these points, and this was further validated with some field surveys I did in 2021. And because we were interested in seeing what potential drivers influence change in tree lines position relatively more than others. We looked at various landscape variables such as slope aspect elevation, as well as some climate variables. Uh, T-mean here refers to average uh, annual temperatures. AGDD is, it stands for accumulated growing degree days. And essentially all that is, is a proxy for growing season length and temperature. So it's a nice little um, index essentially. And this was determined using um, an array of sensor temperature sensors that are distributed across the White Mountains that we uh, maintain as an organization. And I use a very simply simple modeling approach to be able to differentiate uh, to what degree each of these variables were important in determining the amount of change we saw in our tree lines. And so to show you some, some of our first results here, um, all the areas in yellow from these two ranges, the presidentials are on the left, Katans on the right are areas of potential tree line advance or tree encroachment over the intervening, intervening time period between the old and new imagery. This translates to about a three meter per decade shift in the tree line in vertical elevation. The word average is doing a lot of heavy lifting because there's a lot of variation depending on where you are um, near the alpine zone on these ranges. It's not all uniform. Some places don't experience shifts, other places experience relatively more shifts. Ultimately, what this means is that any tree encroachment into areas of former alpine could indicate that alpine vegetation that was there could be outcompeted by trees that are moving in. So ultimately, that's a net, net negative for those species. So this is something we're additionally concerned about. Um, as an example of some um, of some images that really tell the story here. Um, we have some eye level photos of the Madison Spring Hut from 1915 and 2020. Uh, this is in the Northern Presidential Range. And you can see in 1915, between 1915 and 2020, we see some um, infilling of Krumholtz patches. There's a lot of coalescing of trees around the hut and some um, new establishment of trees above uh, previous uh, tree line locations. I, no, I, I have to point out that Around these huts, there have been a lot of anthropogenic activities. So some people definitely engaged in some cutting and physical removal of trees. Despite that, there does seem to be some indication that warming does play a role here for sure. So I just wanted to point out, um, it's a very complex story, but we are likely seeing some effect of climate here. <clears throat> and when we split up how much tree lines have advanced through time, based on those four forms I described, with again, the diffuse form being likely the more responsive directly to temperature, we see that indeed that form has shifted up on average more than the, these other classified forms, which would seem to support the idea that if temperature is an important driver here, then any increase probably would 
lead to the results that we see. So that seems to indicate that yes, um, increasing temperature does in some way lead to uh, a shift upslope of these tree lines. And when we look at specific drivers that might be relatively more important in driving these changes, we're seeing things like aspect, so which direction that slope is facing, um, and things like accumulated growing degree days, so temperature related things, and the, their interaction are definitely seeming to play a role here in these dynamics. And again, with this diffuse form, we're seeing that the relationship um, uh, for tree lines at that form between tree line advance and accumulated growing degree days. So again, think of it as essentially a proxy for temperature. Uh, but that relationship is much stronger here in this particular form. And so what we're ultimately seeing is that tree lines that have existed at higher elevation, generally very cold temperatures already are seeing the greater the greatest shifts, which could indicate that trees that are already at their fundamental thermal threshold, any increase in temperature is essentially alleviating, alleviating that, that threshold and they're able to take advantage of that um, and increase growth. Um, that's something that remains to be ultimately tested, but that seems to be what this is indicating. <clears throat> and so just to wrap up this initial foray into this kind of work, with our first hypothesis, we did indeed see significant upslope advance of tree lines across both ranges. But it's important to know that even with this rate of advance, the rate of warming that we're seeing far outpaces um, the rate that trees are able to match. So there's this lag between warming and the response of trees here. And that could be due to a whole number of reasons. <clears throat> um, our second hypothesis was also supported. We saw greater upslope shifts of these diffuse, probably more temperature sensitive tree lines, which is interesting for us in that we could possibly target these very specific tree lines using very simple survey, field survey based methods to indicate uh, how severe climate uh, change is or how severe warming is. And again, we found that both climate and topography pay, play uh, an interacting role in determining how much advance we see in these tree lines. And so it's important to keep both of those things in mind. It's a very complex story and complex interaction. And so just as a quick note, obviously we're not done with this work. There's a lot of other questions that uh, remain outstanding, but we now have very powerful tools to start to address these questions. Uh, for instance, we have this technology called LIDAR, which actually allows us to measure um, canopy height um, directly from flyovers over these mountains. So we don't have to rely on these historic aerial photo uh, images anymore. Um, as we move forward, we can con make continuous flyovers of these areas and actually better monitor changes in tree lines through time. Obviously, it's this is a quite new, um, new-ish emerging technology, at least for this region. So uh, we don't have that historical baseline yet, but in the future, this will be very handy. Uh, we're also going to be working with devices called dendrometers. These devices can actually measure growth directly on um, individual trees by measuring their outward growth through time. And this will be useful to see if growth limitation is really the driving force behind shaping these tree lines. So stay tuned for all of that work. But now I want to take a little bit of a 180 and look at the other math, uh, other big bioindicator um, in terms of plant communities. Uh, and that is looking at plant phenology uh, in montane environments, not just alpine, but also slightly lower elevation deciduous forests. And so for those who are not familiar, Phenology refers to the timing of life history events of both plants and animals and their relationships with climate. And so if we're thinking about uh, woodland flowers, we would essentially be thinking about the timing of say leaf out or the timing of flowering or the timing of seed, uh, seed step. All of these things are generally uh, tightly controlled by climate, other factors as well, but temperature seem to play a big role in determining um, specific timing of these events. And so because we think that phenology could be a very useful indicator for uh, monitoring progression of, of, of changing climate, uh, the AMC has very, been very interested historically in monitoring this through time. And so that really begins with uh, our mount, our, uh, excuse me, our initial mountain watch project back in 2004. 
where we set up permanent fixed plots in the um, alpine zone uh, in the presidentials uh, and in the whites. Uh, looking at the um, flowering and other phenology of uh, alpine plants. This was expanded in 2008 uh, with uh, our incorporation of lower elevation plots that looked at uh, woodland understory forbs. So that's your herbaceous species that exist in the forest understory, as well as trees. Um, a big change happened in 2014 when we started to partner with the National Phenology Network, or NPN. We took a more standardized approach to our data collection. So now when we collect phenology data uh, through our organization, we can upload this directly to this massive uh, database. And all the data is standardized and can be used interchangeably with, with uh, data from other organizations. I think the most exciting development is in 2019 with our uh, creation, with the creation of multiple iNaturalist uh, projects. This allows citizen science uh, scientists to actually collect phenology data for us um, that we vet and we can then use um, for our various research projects. And this is really cool because it expands, greatly expands the spatial and temporal um, area we can cover uh, well beyond our, our fixed plot approach. And I'll talk a little bit, a tiny bit about the end, uh, in the end, as to why everyone here should be on iNaturalist. I've got to plug it a little bit. And so now that we've collected what is essentially this massive 18 year phenology data set from a variety of uh, indicator species, uh, we thought it was high time to start asking some very fundamental basic uh, ecological questions. Uh, one being on a very basic level, what are the patterns, both spatial and temporal of spring flowering phenology? Um, we don't discount uh, fall phenology, but we think that the first four ways into this, looking at spring phenology are very important to determine sort of like a, a baseline understanding of what's going on with these, with these communities. Uh, what are some relationships between phenology and climate? Is it true that warming does make flowering happen earlier? Can we actually detect that? Um, another question could be how does woodland form phenology, so our woodland understory plants, how does their phenology compare to canopy closure or tree phenology or alpine phenology? How do these groups compare to each other? And I will go into a little bit about a case study that we uh, actually came up with for this. And lastly, is there any evidence for phenological advancement as a result of warming? So related to the second question, do we actually see a widespread response of these plants and entire communities to warming? <laughs> and so the first thing I want to go into is a little bit of a case study that we developed um, stemming from this, this wealth of data that we collected. And it's this idea that has to do with uh, uh, spring uh, phenological escape, or this idea of a shifting phenological window. And what I mean uh, by that is this. So in any deciduous forest uh, canopy, uh, or forest rather, uh, in the spring, understory plants and a lot of spring ephemerals tend to leaf out and flower much earlier than the canopy above closes. So it's this very small period of very high light environment where these plants are able to do the work of photosynthesis, fix a lot of the sugars that they're going to need throughout the year. And then once the canopy closes and low light conditions prevail in the understory, then they can shut off their uh, much of their um, uh, photosynthetic mechanisms and they can just sort of ride off of the, the, the sugars they've already fixed. So it's this very small window of time that it's extremely important for these understory plants to really take advantage of. And the timing of these events, both the flowering of understory plants and the, uh, the closure of the canopy are dictated by uh, things like temperature in the spring. Now with warming, that kind of throws a wrench into the whole thing. And there could be three scenarios that could come from warming. Either both of these events happen earlier, but they happen earlier at the same rate. They advance at the same rate, meaning that that window stays the same. There's no net negative or positive for these understory plants. There could be a scenario where there's an expansion of this window where understory plants leaf out and flower earlier than the canopy closes, meaning a net positive for these plants given they have more time to fix the sugar they need. There could be other problems with that, such as a mismatch with their pollinators or dispersions. We won't get into that, but that's possible. The other scenario could be a contraction 
where leaf out occurs earlier than uh, understory flowering takes place. So this window shrinks, which could lead to a net carbon loss for these species. So there's a myriad of scenarios that could occur here. And we're, we were interested to see if, given that the, the data we've collected through time, could we detect which way this window is shifting? And so we already have evidence for what could possibly happen. So this is actual data from 2021 and 2019. 2021 was a slightly, slightly warmer year than average. And what I'm showing here is the peak uh, flowering time of an understory ephemeral species, red trillion, and leaf out of uh, canopy tree yellow birch. And you can see in this warmer year, those peaks kind of match up. So that window for these two species is kind of small. However, in a cooler year between these two species, there's more of a gap between these two events. Red trillium is flowering earlier than yellow birch is leafing out, which would seem to indicate if we were to extrapolate out that at a cooler year, we would expect a greater amount of time for these species, to, uh, for understory species to be able to fix the sugar they need. However, these are just two species at two years. We have access to dozens of species. We have access to 18 years of data. Can we see wide scale, uh, widespread trends uh, across entire communities. And so that was the goal of this particular study. And to do this, we had three groups of species that we targeted, our woodland forbs, which are, you can think of as your spring ephemeral or your understory woodland plants. So things like Canada mayflower or trilliums. We have can uh, canopy trees, which are our sugar maple, our beech, our birches. And we have alpine plants, which if anyone's hiked in the whites, uh, you've definitely seen a time or two. So we have our diapensia up here, in the top left, Labrador tea, Mount Cranberry, Bog Bilberry. And so I think this is the really cool part. Given these three different data sources, we were able to synthesize over 2 million individual phenological observations between 2004 and 2022. It's a massive wealth of data that really has not been replicated in other group, by other groups or organizations. So I think what we have is really special in that regard. Uh, I pared this down to roughly 118,000 observations. Now on the left, I'm showing a map of the location of those observations in the Northeast region. And so all the green are locations of old mountain watch permanent plots. There, this is what happens when we add in some of the NPN plots here in yellow. And then this is a real good shout out for the utility of iNaturalist. This is what happens when we include all of our iNat derived data. It really expands the spatial distribution of, of the data we have. So it's extremely useful. And so given all this data, I was able to do a few things. One, look at different correlations between uh, the day of year of flowering for woodland and alpine plants against the day of year of leaf out for trees. Uh, so in the spring, we're really looking at uh, either leaf out or flowering uh, time. These are really big phenophases for us. And from that, you can calculate things like median flowering or leaf out time for individual species or for individual years. Um, you can look at relationships between different climate variables and uh, these, these phenological events. What I did was I used, I'm not going to get into it too much, but some fancy statistical uh, know-how to look at whether or not that phenological window I described was either shifting larger, was either expanding, or was it contraction, or was it contracting, or was it staying the same? And I did this for the whole AT corridor. So we have observations across the entire Appalachian mountain range. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the Northeast specifically, but just know that this is a, a more widespread study, or wide scale study. And so as I mentioned from from these data, we can calculate rough median uh, uh, leaf out times, flowering times, different phenological events that happen. So for instance, for Canada Mayflower, uh, median flowering time for the species is around June 13th across our study region. And again, we can do this for whatever species we'd like that we have ample data for or for whatever year. Uh, looking at different predictors of uh, flowering time specifically, we see that elevation and mean spring temperature, that is temperature between uh, April and June each year, are very good indicators, of, are very good um, predictors of, um, of these events. 
specifically in the spring, of course. And so these are the things we really key in on um, when we're trying to predict when, say, leaf out flowering will occur. And just for examples of individual species within each of the three groups I mentioned, um, a lot of the understory herbaceous species of these forbs have very clean relationships uh, between spring mean temperature and the day of year of, of whatever event you're looking at, in this case, flowering. Uh, the slope here indicates um, is a pretty important uh, number for us. So basically all this means is that for every um, increase of one degree C, we see this event, this median event happen about five days earlier. And so you can take those numbers and you can really be, you can really start to predict what will happen if you were to say, see one degree of warming or two degrees or three degrees, you can be able to predict that. Uh, for trees like red maple, this relationship is also negative, uh, is a little weaker. And for our mountain cranberry, which is our representative alpine species, this relationship, while also negative, kind of breaks down a little bit. It's a little more messy. And as you can see, this is the general, this will be the general trend or general pattern for, for these three groups of species. Looking across the whole AT corridor, uh, the relationship between the day of year of flowering and mean spring temperature, we can see it's very well defined for our woodland understory plants, um, as well as our trees, although they're not parallel with one another, so their response is a little different. And for our alpine species, it's a pretty weak relationship. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about the end, uh, at the end as to what may be going on with our alpine plant species. And I think it's important to uh, show everyone that warming is not consistent throughout this broader region. So if you take just New England and separate it out from the mid-Atlantic or the southern part of the AT, what you see is that we're experiencing significantly, uh, we're experiencing more warming and significant warming between the years of the study. Uh, study period, so 2004 to present. Uh, while there is evidence of warming in those southern regions, it's not statistically significant as yet, at least according to the data that we have. So we would probably expect to see some more plant response in the north in our region compared to down there. And that's kind of what we get. So th this graph is a little heavy, so I'll go through it very slowly. So on the y-axis, what we're seeing is spring temperature sensitivity. All that means is that for every uh, degree C, one degree C of Celsius, uh, one degree Celsius of warming, that's how many days that event happens earlier. See the y-axis is negative, so that means this thing happens earlier. So in the case of our forbs and our alpine species, this is how many days earlier flowering occurs. And for our tree species, this is how many days earlier leaf out occurs. And this is separated by our uh, by region, so the Southern AT, Mid-Atlantic section, and then in the North in New England. And what we can see here is that for every group in every um, every region, we're seeing their phenologies advance. They, be, they become earlier with warming, as we would expect, as what everyone talks about. What's important here is that in the North, we're seeing that our understory plants are advancing much earlier than our, our tree. Uh, our trees are advancing. So we're actually seeing evidence of an expansion of that phenological window. Um, there, these understory plants have, are flowering and have more time in highlight environments, which could be a net positive for these species, which is kind of counterintuitive when we think of climate. We always think of it in a negative light. Uh, that's not to say that this is ultimately going to be good for these species, but it is something important to know. The other cool thing about this graph is that when we look at our alpine species, while we do see that it does have some temperature sensitivity, it's very weak and it's very small. So what is going on with these species? Because we know in other parts of the world, alpine species are responding to warming, but it doesn't really seem to be the case as much here. So that's kind of an outstanding question as well. So just to wrap up this little section, I can tell you uh, what the most one of the more important things that we found through this is just having more uh, more sources of data and including iNaturalist really enhances the both the temporal and spatial resolution of, of that data that we've been able to collect it's been super helpful for us and through this work we have a pretty good baseline understanding of dif different spring uh, phenological metrics for many different species which is really helpful foundational knowledge <clears throat> 
what we the patterns that we see both across latitude and elevation are what we expect. You go up higher in elevation and latitude, you see later flower your leaf out because it's cooler in general. <clears throat> as I said, with our alpine species, we're not really seeing that same response as we are with lower elevated species. And the question is, why is that? And I have a whole slide devoted to that, so stay tuned for just one second. But regardless, could we potentially use some of these species in the future uh, as useful bioindicators of change? Uh, are there any species that might stand out? And that's still an outstanding question as well. <clears throat> but ultimately, I think what's important here is that spring phenology in general could be used to um, tell us something very important about uh, processes of forest regeneration, uh, forest resilience, forest health in the face of climate, uh, climate change. And ultimately, we think there will be many different climate winners and losers in terms of species that will likely really depend on the spatial context, so where those species find themselves, and it will also really depend on the traits of those individual species. So I guess the answer here is that things are very complicated. There's a lot of nuance, but we are working on it. And um, hopefully we have something important to say in this, in this area moving forward. And I promised I'd talk a little bit about alpine plant phenology. As I said, things didn't seem to track very well with climate. The reasons there could be many. I'm going to discuss some possibilities here really quickly. Uh, first, um, is this some sort of adaptive response? So remember, these alpine species are growing in very extreme environments, especially at the top of Mount Washington, worst weather on earth. Um, it's possible that they don't have a lot of wiggle room to change their flowering time, just because if they did, they might flower too early, a late frost hits, which is extremely likely and kills them all. So it could be just that they've evolved this, this lack of response essentially to warming. It could also be that the topography at these sites are extremely complex. So you, these species might occasionally find themselves in a somewhat protected micro environment, which might shield them from sort of the direct um, um, weather related uh, issues that they might face. Also important to remember that a lot of the times, including now, actually, on Mount Washington, uh, snow is covering these uh, individual species, individual plants. And so flowering is not likely to occur when they're in this state. So it could be that snow depth in general might form an upper limit to which flowers, uh, these, these plants can't flower past. Um, although the loss of snowpack through climate warming may um, remove this barrier. It could also be that we just have not seen enough warming at these high elevation sites to really cause a response with our alpine vegetation. Um, again, some of the worst weather on earth, even if on average warming has occurred, there are still a lot of very extreme events that occur here that could limit these plants' ability to respond. And of course, there's always the, the case to be made that we haven't collected enough data or that it's some combination of all of these. And honestly, some part of those are probably true. But again, we are working on it. In fact, I wanted to share really briefly uh, some very preliminary results uh, that I've been working on uh, producing between myself and uh, Ken Kimball, if anyone is familiar out there with him. He's probably on here now. And basically what I'm showing you here on the left is a transition matrix. Um, some background, uh, we have permanent plots on uh, the Alpine Garden on Mount Washington and uh, Lafayette and the Franconia Ridge, in which we've been monitoring alpine plant communities through time um, from 1983 up to the last survey was in 2017. And here, what we're showing you is the proportion of plants that fall into one of these uh, four groups um, in 1983 and how they've transitioned, how those points in space have transitioned to possibly another group of plants in 2017. So for instance, in this bottom left corner, you can see that an area that was classified as an Arctic plant species, many of those have transitioned into what we call a transitional group of plant species. These are generally plants that exist in the alpine zone, but also could exist at lower elevation, not true alpine species. So things that are woody and shrubby, like bog bilberry or Labrador tea, sometimes balsam fir, 
Um, this coordination plot on the right, I'm not going to go into the weeds too much. Um, all I'm going to say with this is that the air, that arrows that line up with this year arrow indicate uh, positive correlation through time. So as we move forward in time to the present, we're seeing um, an increase in mean temperatures. We're seeing an increase in transitional species as indicated by this arrow next to year. And we're seeing an increase in three-dimensional structure of plants. So basically the main takeaway here is that we're seeing more woody species, more shrubby species, uh, less true Arctic species occupying these alpine areas that we've been surveying. And this roughly corresponds to the sort of shrub, uh, the shrubification and the, the tree encroachment that we see at high latitude environments closer to the Arctic Circle. Um, so this just means that we are seeing possibly, again, these are preliminary results, so I won't put too much weight into them, but we could possibly be seeing some shifts of alpine communities to more of these shrubby, less true alpine uh, communities. And so to put this all together, what have we learned through all of this? I've been going on and on for 40-ish minutes now. These are the big points. One, for our tree lines, a useful bioindicator for us. We are seeing an advanced upslope consistent with warming, but this is not uh, uniform everywhere on these alpine summits. And it really depends on the specific temperatures that these plants are experiencing and where they find themselves in the landscape. So what aspect they find themselves on. We are seeing that woodland plants at slightly lower elevations are advancing their spring phenologies. That's both our understory plants and our trees. Although this is not really as evident for our alpine species for a number of reasons, all of which I've talked about a little bit. And lastly, we, as I talked about in that last slide, we're seeing that alpine plant communities are starting to become more shrubby or more transitional. Again, that's very preliminary work. I wanna harp on that. But if that does hold, that would be um, very indicative of what we might experience if climate was a big factor here. There are other factors that could be driving this, but climate seems to be a big one. So ultimately, what does the future hold for montane plants in these systems? Well, these first three points kind of, you know, shed light on, on what the future could hold. But ultimately, we are still working uh, on many of these questions, uh, working on the finer details and trying to be able to predict what these communities and what these forests and what these systems will look like. Ultimately, the point being but we need to know this information so we can better inform conservation and management of these, these really special places. That is the ultimate goal here. And so with that, I will wrap up um, real quick. I just wanna mention um, the AMC research team, a lot of whom I believe are watching. So thank you all for your help. Um, you all know who you are, the names are here. Um, and I just wanna also recognize the different agencies and funding sources that made all of this possible. Um, that which fund me and my colleagues and which you know help really promote really great research here in these these special systems and real quick before I stop talking I just wanted to give a quick shout out to these different uh, uh, citizen science based organizations in particular if you are not on iNaturalist supporting our the AMC's various projects I highly recommend you do so at least check it out and I'd be happy to talk about those uh, in the Q a so thank you and I think Brian, I'm ready to take some questions. All right, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jordan. That that was amazing. You covered some um, some great ground there. I know there's a lot of work ongoing uh, and a lot of future work that you're that you're all excited about there. So I, I appreciate you being able to share not only your work but some of the work from your colleagues as well. Well, we got some great questions already in the Q and A. Um, you at on uh, Zoom at the moment. So again, if you're joining us through Zoom, feel free. Please use the Q&A button that you can find on your toolbar to submit a question. We'll try and get to as many questions uh, as possible here. Um, I'm, uh, this is a, a great question from uh, Rick right out the gate, who is curious about uh, CO2 and um, some of its role overall in, in plant mm -hmm. growth. Obviously, plants need CO2 to grow. Um, uh, Rick is asking if, if CO2 alone can improve some plant growth or it's been shown to uh, improve plant growth in arid regions and environments. Do we know if CO2 can affect the tree line position beyond uh, 
just you know the climate change uh, aspects? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, yes, it's true. Obviously, trees need CO two to continue to grow. Although, really, in this system, it's CO two is not the limiting factor. Um, obviously, it's only going up and would probably only serve to enhance growth. But growth really here is being limited by temperature. It's probably also being limited by uh, soil resources, so uh, lack of nitrogen or whatever else that plants need in that very, uh, for lack of a better word, kind of cruddy soil that you find at high, these high elevations. So while that is indeed important, what really talking about here is, is ultimately the limiting factors that would, would prevent trees from being able to encroach up further upslope. So that's uh, cold temperature limitations, that's soil uh, uh, soil nutrients. And ultimately, what I didn't really go into a lot here was some of the work that some of my other colleagues are working on, and that has to do with uh, rime ice uh, causing physical damage to trees and strong winds, which can also uh, desiccate and cause physical damage to trees, which are also both important. So I definitely don't wanna give anyone the impression that it's temperature alone that's that's driving these dynamics. It's a sort of a combination of all these, really. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, hey, you actually knocked out another question right there from Tim who asked a, a, you know, a question in that vein, you know, you obviously mm -hmm. spoke quite a bit about temperature temperature yeah. change and Tim's curious yeah how did the other factors come into play and certainly those you know mechanical weathering events like you're just mentioning with the combination of freezing fog and high winds you know those are other factors and, and any any other you know long-term trends that you know you or your colleagues have explored yeah so in addition to the wind and uh, icing um, Lars I don't know if Lars is watching but they're working on uh, factors like relative humidity um, wind force which is essentially a function of um, the surface area of the plant and wind speed and um, temperature um, so there's a lot of very interesting niche factors that go into this um, i know there's we haven't done this but there's been talk of looking into uh, uh, light levels which could indirectly impact tree growth via mechanisms like photo inhibition and things like that. Um, we can get really get into the weeds into a lot of different factors that drive uh, drive tree line formation. Um, I think we fit the big ones, but yeah, there's there's a ton. I think in my case, temperature is the thing that we know is increasing, and so we definitely wanted to take a deep dive into seeing if that was at play here. Uh, but yeah, it's it's multifactorial. There's many things going on at the same time, so it's important yeah. to keep that. In mind. Yeah. And like you mentioned before, you know, perhaps, I mean, there's always, you can always use more data and, and, and uh, there are plenty of limiting factors as to why in some cases you can't get instrumentation or the variables perhaps that you might want to get uh, working, especially above tree line and uh, right. the White Mountains. Um, and, hey, Karen asked a great and very practical question here about um, timing for, you know, weather permitting, we'll, we'll, uh, Karen saying we're going to be at the Alpine Garden this weekend. How do you know? How do you think? What do you think about the timing right now for viewing Alpine flora? I know I was up at Cow Pasture on the side of Mount Washington mm -hmm. on Friday. We saw a little bit of Alpine azalea maybe just blooming up there. I think maybe just a little lower down. I don't know. What are you seeing, Jordan? Yeah. So I was up there last week. There's definitely a lot of diapensia out right now. It's looking really, uh, really pretty. Um, the beginnings of Alpine Azalea, uh, Lapland Rose Bay. Um, at lower elevations, you will see some Redora and some uh, some laurel starting to come come around. Um, I heard from one person that the uh, the bloom seemed a little late this year. Um, I think that might be that might have something to do with our very snowy and icy and kind of crappy June so far. But I think. As long as you have the stomach for dealing with the high winds and the, the rain and the uh, really cold temperatures, I think this weekend would probably be a good time. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, lot, lots going on this weekend around the White Mountains and uh, Al you can add alpine flowers to, to the list there. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's gorgeous uh, if, if you time it just right. Um, hey, Keith asks a really good question here, one that I was kind of intrigued about. Um, He's, Keith asks, are you seeing a rise in invasive species that could be attributed to the warming trend or how how might invasives potentially, you know, factor into any of the shifts um, that you've been studying? 
Yeah. So if you were to talk to Dan Sperduto over at the White Mountain National Forest uh, as, a, as a staff member, uh, he would tell you all about the uh, invasive dandelions up in the alpine zone. Uh, in terms of alpine systems in general, uh, there definitely are some invasives up there. They don't seem to occupy a huge amount of area. Uh, so I would say their impact, at least for tree line dynamics, might be negligible. At lower elevation, if we're talking about phenology, um, I think invasive pests may play more of a role uh, in our deciduous, uh, in our northern hardwood forests. Uh, if we're talking about uh, uh, tree pathogens, like things that are involved with beech bark disease or beech leaf disease soon, or other things like that, that def definitely plays a role uh, in the timing of canopy leaf out at lower elevation. Um, interesting enough, uh, a lot of invasive plants down in the lower elevations, they tend to leaf out earlier than our native plants. They sort of are able to take advantage of a more, uh, of a higher light environment for longer. So that's how they benefit. Uh, but in terms of altering the phenologies of these understory plants, they're, they're not, they don't have as direct a role, I'll say, as opposed to perhaps shading out, um, some of the lower statute plants <clears throat> but that's a great question <clears throat> yeah definitely and I, I mean this is a nice question from um from kenneth as well that you know obviously uh you know you're you're working in the world of research i'm sure there are times where maybe your focus uh you feel like oh where, <laughs> where does this connect elsewhere to the world but kenneth's curious you know what are the practical applications or maybe implications of you know your research and the work of that you're doing and, and for your colleagues because uh, i imagine yeah. there's a pretty good tie-in with the other mission areas of the amc yeah well i definitely can can agree that sometimes we we tend to get a little uh stuck in our own heads and we just think oh it's research it's important because it's cool i mean i i definitely think that all the time uh but in terms of practical application there's i there's definitely a few things that that we're thinking about on the horizon um one thing that relates to the phenology work that we're doing is we're, we're working directly with uh, the National Phenology Network as well as the Forest Service to come up with uh, monitoring protocols that can help inform us about um, things like forest regeneration, seedling recruitment. Uh, these things really play a role into figuring out um, how forests will maintain their resiliency through time, especially as climate change continues to accelerate. Um, Essentially, the, the real impetus behind what we're doing is to figure out what are useful indicators for the severity and the pace of climate change. And from that, can we then inform different management techniques, both where they take place and when they take place? Uh, can we then inform these tech, this management um, in the future to promote greater resiliency? I think the ultimate goal here is is ultimately not to keep forests and alpine areas as they are now. It's to help them better, better weather the storm. And to, the way to do that is to initially be able to take a, a, a pulse or a baseline of what changes are occurring. And so, yeah, it's it's somewhat conceptual this research at times, but really we need this foundational knowledge to move to move forward in any sort of application. So, <clears throat> I guess that's my long-winded answer <laughs> for that. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, connect, I mean, connections galore, yeah. certainly on, on the, you know, the conservation side of things and messaging yeah. to hikers, other recreationalists, other users and in, in, in the area, I'm sure there, there are many uh, uh, connection mm -hmm. points as, as you're getting out there. And I'm curious, and, and David asked the great question here as well, you know, how the changes that you're seeing here looking at, you know, in the Northeast, I mean, how does this compare to other mountain regions either throughout the country or globally, do you know? Yeah, so the, the work that I've read up to now has been largely very similar to what we've been finding. Um, there's been a couple of meta-analysis I've read that have found very similar, uh, similar results in terms of numbers. Um, when it comes to tree line advance. So that three meters per decade average figure that I came up with, it's pretty much on it's pretty much on par with every single mountain range I've looked at in the northern hemisphere. So we're definitely not unique. Um, obviously the presidentials have very extreme weather, very severe 
things are very, everything's just very extreme here. But in terms of, of you know, broad comparisons, we're not, we're not unique in that way. Um, now, when we talk about alpine plant phenology, we are unique in the sense that we're not seen as great of a response to warming as other alpine systems in the world. In fact, our lack of response is kind of unique in that way. And that itself could be a result of just the geography of, of, of where we find ourselves. And of course, you know, you, you all at the observatory could probably talk a lot about, you know, what, what meteorological factors uh, play a role in that uniqueness. Um, but in terms, yeah, in terms of tree lines, pretty par for the course. In terms of alpine plants, it's a little different. <clears throat> well, so Jordan, I, maybe um, mm. sadly, I mean, we have we still have some really great questions here, and uh, I'd encourage folks if we don't get a chance to answer your questions here tonight, reach out to um, education at mountwashington.org. Maybe just um, time for one more question here, a good one from Sandy, which uh, might be a nice one to close on. I'm just kind of curious, what, what prompted you to get into this field? How'd you, how'd you end up here? Why, why, you know, was it always plants for you or, you know, what, what brought you here? Yeah. I don't know if we have time to go fully into that. I'll say very briefly that uh, being out in these places does a huge amount for my mental well-being and health. So I would say that first and foremost is why I do it. Um, honestly, I guess the real reason would be I, I've really taken a lot of my enjoyment from being in these places and just from what I do, I, I know that these, these places have a lot of threats, um, uh, coming down the pipe, especially as a result of climate change, but other things, other influences. So, you know, I kind of, I have this desire to want to be able to, uh, do work that could potentially benefit, protect, and advance the mission of the ANC to continue to conserve these areas so other people can have the same amount of enjoyment that I do. So that's, I don't know, I guess in a nutshell, that's what it boils down to. <clears throat> oh, I, I think you, you, you're probably not alone in a lot of the folks <laughs> who are joining you here tonight. Uh, that's certainly a special place that we, we find a lot of value in. Um, well, Jordan, I, I really appreciate um everything you shared with us tonight for taking the time to share your expertise, mm -hmm. your expertise this evening. Um, again, for folks who uh, didn't have a chance to get to any of your questions this evening, feel free. You can reach us at uh, education at mountwashington.org. We can put you in touch uh, with Jordan as well for anything um, we weren't able to answer this evening. Uh, if you enjoyed tonight's free program, we would strongly encourage you to make a donation to help support programs like these over at mountwashington.org. Also give the plug for the AMC over at outdoors.org. Uh, for the observatory, you can hit the donate button that's in the upper right hand corner of our web page there. If you have thoughts about tonight's program or even suggestions for some future programs, please take some time. If you can fill out our Google survey, which will uh, we'll follow up here in, a, in your Zoom screen here and also in a thank you email, we'd really appreciate that. And then finally, don't forget to join us for our next Science and Mountains program. That'll be Tuesday, July 18th right after Seek the Peak. And that's when the observatory's own Director of Technology, Keith Garrett, and our Director of Weather Operations, Jay Brocklow, will discuss more measurement techniques and monitoring throughout the White Mountains as the observatory's regional network of automated weather stations here in the, in the White Mountains, known as the Mesonet. So I hope you join us for that program. Check out any programs you might have missed in the past. You can go over to mm -hmm. mountwashington.org slash SITM. Well, thanks again, everyone. Thanks, Jordan, one more time. Have a great night. Take care, everybody. Take care. Thanks, Brad. Yeah, bye-bye.